So today we have our very first edition of a brand new series, which I'm calling Words with Friends. And it is very much exactly what it says on the tin. This is me having a conversation about words, i.e. having some words with some people I adore who also could be described as my friends. And today I have the legend that is Bob Berg. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. It's so great to, to be with you, have a cup of coffee with you. And, and uh, uh, you know, you're the one who knows exactly what to say. I don't. <laughs> but I learn from you and I try to get close to it. Well, Bob, um, I've been learning for you for years. So we are like 10 year anniversary from you putting out the Go Giver book. Yeah. I can't believe that was 10 years ago. And I remember picking up my first copy thinking, wow, this has changed the world of personal wow. development books for me and gone on to follow your work since. So calling you now a friend is, is, a, is a true gift. Likewise. But, to, but today we're talking about something different, right? You've got a new book. You're at it again, putting another one out in the, in the Go-Giver series. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the few that got my hands on this ahead of time. And this is, this is, is the Go-Giver Influencer, which is a little story, right? About a most persuasive idea where you've collaborated with John David Mann again on a book about influence. Why, why do another book? Oh, great question, because you always wonder, aren't there enough books out there? On every topic? <laughs> And uh, we, we kind of felt the timing was good for this one. We're, we're right now seeing a world, and we see this on social media, certainly Phil, all the time, where, where people are angry and they're insulting and they are hurling these invectives toward people. What they're not doing is they're not influencing. They're not persuading. They're more or less keeping themselves and keeping others on their same teams, if you will, where the truth isn't necessarily the objective as much as just feeling good about being on a certain side and holding a certain opinion, right? Right. Uh, you know, we've, we've all seen where someone, let's say, says something on Facebook. They make a yeah. And someone writes back, they comment, I can't believe you said people like you were the worst people on earth and you're trying to ruin the country and blah, 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 blah. Now, does the person who's, who's being insulted like this, do they ever respond back by saying, ah, oh, Thank you. I hadn't thought of it that way before. <laughs> I, I thought I was right. But now that you say it that way, I am going to totally renounce my beliefs and agree with you. No, of course not. It just keeps people more and more. So we thought, how can we kind of now reshape these conversations? And which doesn't mean people have to agree with each other but it means we can dialogue with each other with a lot more understanding, a lot more kindness, and we can, when the circumstances are, are, are right, influence and persuade people and kind of move the world along another step. Okay. So it makes sense that the word that we talk about today is that word influence, right? That's the mm -hmm. word we should probably talk about. So if I'm looking for a dictionary definition of the word influence from Bob Berg himself, what does influence mean? Well, on a very very basic level, influence is simply the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a specific goal. Uh, that's the definition, Phil. I don't believe that's necessarily the, the, the essence or the substance of influence. I believe the essence of influence is about pull, pull as opposed to push, as in how far can you push a rope? And the answer is not very far, at least not very fast or, or very effectively, which is why great influencers don't push. You very rarely hear someone say, wow, that Dave or that Mary, she is so influential. She has a lot of push. With <laughs> right, right. Sure is pushy, man. We just love, right. No, she has a lot. She's influential. She has a lot of pull because okay. that's what influence is. Influence is an attraction. Great influencers attract people, first to themselves and only then to their ideas. Okay. And they do this, you know, again, not through pushing their will, uh, not through compliance, which is unsustainable at best, uh, not through bullying or manipulation. They do this through tapping into what that other person is looking to accomplish and then aligning the two together. Gotcha. I think I got you anyway. So we're thinking about influence. Why is it though people don't talk about the fact that they were influenced? Like people don't say I was influenced into doing something. That's a very mm. rare thing for somebody to say. So we might want to influence or be an influencer, but why do we not like to be on the receiving end of influence? 
Uh, well, you know, it might be, first, it might be an ego thing. People want to right. feel it was their decision. And all right. we all know, you know, we, we know the saying that when, when we say it, you know, that it's, it's one thing when someone else says it, they believe it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think when we really do influence effectively, all we're really doing is tapping into what that person wants anyway. I mean, when you think about it, what is selling? And you, you're a sales expert. And I mean, there's nobody better. And, and we both know, Phil, that selling is nothing more than discovering what the other person wants. Right. Desires and helping them to get it. Right. Got it. So we're just really helping them to, 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 to make a decision that they already want to make anyway. Okay. But isn't influence like a real close line to manipulation and manipulation is bad? Well, in, uh, manipulation is bad. Um, influence, influence itself, which again is is the ability to move someone to. Uh, there are two aspects of of influence. You know, influence itself is a principle, and as you know, universal laws and principles aren't good or bad; they just are. Uh, you look at gravity. Gravity is a universal law on Earth. It works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You believe it. Where doesn't matter if you belong to some organization. People against the belief of gravity, P, A, P, G, whatever, okay? Uh, it works. Now, we say, is gravity good or bad? Well, it's neither. It just is. It, it, it has good results when it keeps us from floating aimlessly up into space. It has what could be called bad results when we walk off a seven-story building, okay? So it's the same in terms of influence. You can influence one of two ways. You could do it through manipulation, which is force, it's compliance, it's fraud, it's all the lousy, yucky thing, right? Or you could influence through persuasion, which is a way of helping to build everyone in the process. Now, both persuaders and manip and you could say, by the way, manipulation and persuasion are cousins. Right. Because, <laughs> right, people, right? Uh, right. But one's the, one's the good cousin, persuasion, one's the evil cousin, manipulation. Um, and so, you know, so that's the thing. We, we want to, we neither want to be manipulated by others, nor should we want to manipulate others. It's also manipulation, you know, sometimes can get you what you want in the short term. This is Words with Friends. We can have phone calls in the okay? background. We're all good. All right. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this stuff happens in the real world. So, so, you know, we, we neither want to be manipulated, nor do we want to manipulate someone else. Manipulation, some, some a manipulator sometimes can get what they want, right? In the, the short term, very rarely is it sustainable. With a persuader, they can get what they desire both in the short term and in the long term. So okay. not only is persuasion a much better way, a more righteous way to influence, it's actually a much more effective way to influence. Okay. So in today's world where there are lots of difference of opinions, lots of polarizing views, there's people that are kind of, I don't agree with that, or they're trying to force their opinions onto other people. How do we go about this in a more eloquent way that means that perhaps both parties win? What could people think, do, or act differently to be able to get more of their own way more often? Yeah. Well, the first thing we need to do is master our emotions. That's really where it all begins, because it's only when we are in control of our own emotions that we're even able to be part of the solution, right? <laughs> that we're even able in the, in the position to take a potentially negative person or situation and turn it into a win for everyone involved. On the other hand, when we allow someone based on what they say or do, whether consciously or unconsciously to push our emotional buttons in a way that we cause ourselves to be sad or defensive or helpless or frustrated or angry, not only are we not part of the solution, we're just as much a part of the problem, if not more so than, than they are. So we know this, and yet how often do we allow this to happen? And if we were to ask, well, why is that? I think the answer is because we're human beings and we are emotional creatures. Um, we'd like to think we're logical, and we are to a certain extent, but we're pretty emotion-based. We make major decisions based on emotion, and we back up those emotion-based decisions with logic. We we rationalize. We, uh, and if you take the word rationalize, it simply means we tell ourselves rational lies. <laughs> we tell ourselves these to, to justify the fact that we did something that we knew we probably shouldn't have done, right? I really wanted that ice cream sundae last night, you know, emotionally, and I could kind of rationalize some reasons for it. Uh, or that we, that we let ourselves lose control and, and, we're counterproductive in our, in our actions. Um, we're not saying that you should forego your emotions uh, or deny okay. your emotions. 
emotions. First, that wouldn't be logical. We're emotional creatures. Plus, well, there's no need to. Emotions are a wonderful part of life. They, they bring us joy. They make life worthwhile. No. What we just simply need to do is make sure that we are the master of our emotions rather than they being the master of us. Or as my great friend Dandi Skumachi, the great leadership speaker, often says, by all means, take your emotions along for the ride, but make sure you are driving the car. Ah. And that's so key. As long as we're in control of our emotions, that, that's, that's fantastic. So when someone says or does something, let's go back to that online thing where someone says, you know, you are a son of a gun for blah, 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 blah. The first thing is before losing control and wanting to get, take a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so it can be that simple. It's just take a breath. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. You got to practice this stuff. And because it's too easy to fly off the handle and especially in person when someone verbally attacks you or someone just says something that annoys you or it's that person who says and does the same thing that always are. So practice like an astronaut would practice before going into space, right? They do hundreds and hundreds of simulations so that by the time they get up there in space, if something, God forbid, happens, it's okay. They've been there. They've done that. They know how to handle it. Now you might say, well, but being up in space isn't the same as simulations or practicing res you know, responding calmly instead of reacting out of control isn't the same as doing it. Not the same, but we both know it's pretty darn close. The, um, the subconscious mind cannot distinguish between that which has happened and that which has been suggested to it over and over again. So to the degree you practice this, you'll find in no time, suddenly you're 95% of the way there of just being able to to be in control and respond and feel great about it and be so much more effective. Okay, so I take a breath and I can practice taking a breath if there's something I disagree with or something I want to be able to change the direction of the conversation. I've taken a breath, but then what do I do or think or act next if okay. I'm looking to be more influential? Now we've got to try to step into the other person's shoes. Now this sounds easier said than it is done, why? because most of us have different size feet. <laughs> right. So we can't step into their shoes. In other words, we come from different belief systems, Phil, yeah. different ways of looking at the world, of seeing the same thing. Gotcha. And until we, and it's just like in a sales situation, until we begin to ask questions, we can't step into their shoes. So we ask questions to, of this person, polite questions, tactful questions, which we'll get to later, you know, the tact and empathy. But, but we ask questions and then we listen. But as one of the, the mentors, George, tells Jillian, listen, not just with your ears. Back up here with your neck, right? Listen, listen with your neck. Back up your neck. Really, you know, put like Cheryl Sa uh, <laughs> Sanderson would say, uh, lean into it, right? <laughs> yeah. Listen with the back of your neck. And what that does, it's a whole different way of listening, you're not listening to critique, you're not listening to judge, you're, you're listening to simply understand this person's shoe size, to ah. listen, understand where they're coming from. And not only does that help you, they understand that and they feel better about you. Okay, so we listen with the back of our, our neck. Uh, now, uh, that gets us part of the way there, but now is a very important part. This is where we want to set the frame. Phil, this is so important because it, it, as you know, I mean, you teach this. When you set the proper frame, you're really 80 to 90% there to being able to, to influence. What is a frame? Well, let's talk about words, right? What is a frame? A frame is the foundation from which everything else transpires, okay? Uh, may I give you a, 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 an example of a great frame Go I'm, for it. Go for it. I'm listening with my neck. So carry on. <laughs> so this is a couple of years ago. I'm in a, a Dunkin' Donuts and I'm, I'm having my coffee and reading. And there's a little boy, a little toddler, two, two and a half years old. He's running around the restaurant and his parents call him over to their table. Well, he starts to run over and suddenly he, he takes a spill. He falls on the floor. Now, he, he didn't get hurt. He was fine. But you could tell he was shocked. Yeah. Right? That wasn't supposed to happen. So what does he do? Well, he immediately looks at the two people in the world he trusts the most, his mom and dad, to get their interpretation of what just happened. What happened, happened. He wants to know what happens next, mom and dad. Yeah. Right? And I truly believe that had they gotten upset, uh, panicked, uh, rushed over, oh no, are you okay? He'd have started crying. But they just handled it beautifully. 
they, they walked over calmly, they had smiles on their face, they applauded, they laughed, they said, oh, what a good trick, that looks like so much fun, and it, he immediately started laughing. What the parents did is they set a productive frame from which he could operate. Got it. And we can do the same thing in any conversation with someone. It might be, Bill, as simple as an inside out from the heart smile. It might be the way we make eye contact with them or the way if we're in a conversation, we kind of open our body language so they know they're welcome. It could be when we are about to present for a prospect and we, we set a real frame where she feels comfortable by saying something like, uh, you know, Mary, while we've been able to help many people with this widget product or service, uh, whether or not it's the right answer for you, we simply can't know without exploring deeper and just determining whether it's the right fit, whether it meets your needs. So please know our conversation is about both of us discovering this. And if it does, great. If not, that's okay too. Right. And so what we've done is we've, we've set the frame that, that she doesn't have to be concerned about being pressured into buying, that we're not there to, you know, at all cost for her. And she has the out, the back door. She knows it's about her and that she, it's her choice. So now she feels so much better about this. Now, that's a frame and that sets it up. The question is, what if someone comes to the table with an already set frame, which is negative, like the person on the internet who comes back yeah, with yeah. a horrible sentence, right? Now we have to reset the frame. Okay. And to do this, we simply, uh, we simply regear. Let me give you an, another very quick example. Um, yeah, let's I'm, do it. Yeah, pulling my car into a parking lot, into a parking space. I wasn't paying attention as I should have been. I nearly clip a guy as he's getting out the driver's side of his car. He was scared. He was, he was shocked. Mostly he was very angry. And he gave me a look, Phil. I mean, if looks could kill. I mean, it was just a, his face was covered with ugly. I mean, it was a horrible. Yeah. Now, I could have, that's a frame he set. Okay, now I'm not blaming him. I, that's people react to different stimuli in different ways. That was sure. a reaction, not a response. And he came at it with an anger frame. Now, had I bought into that frame, which he set, I might have gone, what are you looking at? And he'd have gone, watch where you're going. Ray, watch where you're going. Now, I don't know about you, but I found those things never work out really well. <laughs> it never worked out too good I, for me I don't either. want any part of it, right? If I, yeah. no. So what I did instead is I immediately, I put my hand up in a waving motion. I put a smile of friendly apology on my face. And through the windshield, I went, sorry. And he immediately went, no problem. <laughs> what I did is rather than buying into his frame, I simply reset the frame. Okay. So now we're allies instead of adversaries. We can do that too um, with this person uh, on the air. Let, let, in fact, let's give an example of that right now before we go into the other. other yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay. So, so uh, somebody makes a statement about something and this person says, uh, you are the, the worst human being in the world. You're looking to hurt people. All you care about, blah, 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 you know, whatever it happens to be. Okay. So now what we do, we controlled our emotions. We're not going to say, well, it's you and you, right? We're going to look into why they may be thinking the way we're do they are. Uh, we, we are going to now reset the frame. What if we said something like, hi, uh, Tom, uh, I've got to say, I admire your passion for your beliefs. And I can tell you're someone who really cares about people. Now, here's the key phrase. Like you, I want to live in a country where people are able to, then whatever the point is, blah, yeah. blah, blah. I think the biggest difference is simply in the way we feel is best to go about it. Okay? Now you've totally reframed this. From to, and, and if this person, now remember, you never know how this person, but chances are, and I've had people apologize, by the way, for things, and I've had other people I've taught this to have had people apologize for the way they said something, but that's not usually going to happen, and it doesn't have to. And it's not that you're going to persuade necessarily this person who may be so far to one belief system that that's it, and cert certain people are. But here's what we've got to remember in every one of these transactions, especially online, okay? Not only are you and that person in the conversation, there are lots, Everyone and, lots else. and lots of people who are watching this. And, and here's the thing. There are some people, and let's just for a second put this in the political uh, vernacular. Some people are way on the left and some people are way on the right and they're never going to change. 
but most people feel bang are, in the middle exactly they're in the middle or maybe one side or the other but they're still open they realize that they're not so wrapped up in one right so here's what they're looking for they're looking to who's the person who's making the most cogent points but also that's the logic but also and just as important who is more likable <laughs> who is something, someone who I kind of feel much more attracted to wanting to be in conversation with? Who do I feel I could ask informational questions to without them dogmatically attacking me if I don't agree exactly with, right? Right, right. So this is where we can really do this. So we understand it's not just ourselves. It's not just the other person. There's a lot of people in these conversations. Okay. And, and another point I'm picking up on there is, is maybe sometimes you better to let it go. Like if somebody is at an extreme end of one of these things, that the chances of actually being able to have a great deal of influence on those might be left for another day. Sure. We need to make a decision to say, is there a chance in a frame right. where what we can do is agree upon some form of common goal, some form of common direction, some form of exactly. we're all on the same page. And if we can yeah. get that, we can create movement forward. Exactly. That, that's the okay. thing. We can create movement forward because it may not happen today, but there's an opening for another day. Exactly. Okay. Now, I just want to take a little segue in direction. All of your books have come in the format of a story. It's kind of a, an unfamiliar route towards many a personal development book. Yet it's a tried and tested and proven system of being able to transfer information. We learn from kids in story form, often in some of the quickest ways we've ever learned. Sure. What was it that made you to decide to be able to make what really are quite profound um, points towards the area of influence in the new book, but again to decide to do it in story form using a very precise seven day window of time into some fictional characters' lives? Yeah. Uh, well, this went back to the original Go Giver story, which was sort of based on the premise from Endless Referrals, which was actually my first big book for salespeople, and it was a how to book. Yeah. Uh, and we took the basic premise, all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And we put it into story form, right? Uh, John David Mann, the, the co-author and lead writer and storyteller, who, and you know John, he's just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And, um, and so, you know, we know that stories, as you were saying, they connect on a heart level. Well, I, you know, I had a book out several years ago that I wrote, another how-to book. It was called Adversaries into Allies. Right. And it was a how-to of doing all the things in this book. And, it, you know, it didn't really sell that well. Okay. And, I, and, and I, you know, I've never quite understood why it didn't, but it didn't. <laughs> and so John and I both thought, because we, so, we feel so strongly about the topic and about, you know, influence and about being able to go about it in the right way, we said, wonder if we could take the, the you know, the, 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 the how-to parts from adversaries into allies, but put it into story form so it would more connect on a real heart level with people. And uh, so that's really, that's really why we did it. Well, it works. I mean, I loved it. I couldn't put the thing down. And, and one of the things that I love most about the book is I've been a, a rich student of Dale Carnegie's work through oh. my early years of development. And the greatest book in the world to me was How to Win Friends and Influence People. But it's a slug of a read, right? You've got to study it. You've got to, what did that word say again? What did that paragraph really mean? Like, it's hard. It comes from a time that isn't modern. But I pick up the Go-Giver Influencer and I read through it. And it's laced with core principles that would take me so much time to extract from a book like How to Win Friends and Influence People and get through it in a very concise and beautiful way that still hits home all of those major points, but makes them relevant for today. I think it's a masterpiece in, in, in subtleties and nuances towards the world of influence. Hey, it's, by the way, one of the streets in the story was Dale Drive. <laughs> that was an homage to, uh, to Mr. Carnegie himself. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, his work is, has, has touched so many people's lives. And I just wondered, like, how consciously did you go about being able to weave through so many profound things into, into really what is quite a short story? Uh, you know, I think that's the, the work, that's the hard work on deciding, especially with something like this, because Adversaries into Allies had a whole lot of, of stuff in it. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. A lot. So what do you really take so that you can make the point that's necessary, but obviously it's not a how-to book, it's a story with some how-to aspects and elements. 
And this is where I think the brilliance of John David Mann really comes in. Not only does he just weave such a wonderful tale, but knowing kind of what to have in, but what can come out, you know what I'm saying? And, and so it was really, uh, you know, we, we, we're a good team, but we're a good team because he's so brilliant. <laughs> well, and I think some of the genius in the book though too is, is how it's a product of itself in the way in which the story has been laid out. It is a demonstration of the points that you're looking to be able to make. And it talks towards the power of hypothesis, right? It talks towards the, if we can create hypothetical sets of circumstances, we can move towards and or accept those other points of view more freely. And I know I'm picking the book up and relating to scenarios of Jackson's circumstances and, and where he's feeling and thinking at that moment in time, but then seeing the thoughts and feelings of other characters in the book right. and thinking how they relate to so many other real life scenarios. Well, now I'm, you, oh no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say just what you said was so perfect because you think about it, Jackson and Jillian each had exactly what the other needed. Right. So you'd have thought, this is a marriage made in heaven. You got it. Turned out to be anything but. In every conversation they had, they came away more frustrated. <laughs> and, and the sad thing How is, though, the, yeah. this, this is so true. Right? I'm with a buddy of mine the other day um, out in the South. He's a really good friend of mine and lives in Kentucky. The way they see things in Kentucky about gun crime is different, uh, or carrying, carrying weapons is different to how I see it as a guy coming from the UK. And we can have a heated debate about it because we're two people on the level under the understanding of saying our common interest is we like to feel safe when we go out of the house. Exactly. That's the common interest. And we can have a difference of opinion around that mm -hmm. and then start to influence. Right. But I think the fear that lots of people have about influence is this feeling of right and wrong, this black and white scenario. Whereas what I think I'm learning here is, is it's the movement in the shades of gray that exist in between that says we can nudge over time. It isn't someone's going to change their mind from being a fan of one football team to another football team overnight because of something somebody said. It can change like gradually over a period of time with a drip and a drip and a drip, providing you can open people's minds. Yeah, moving, moving the world forward. And that's, right. that's, you know, that's really what it is. And, you know, it's, it's interesting too, because it's, it's not about compromise. It's about collaboration. Ah, uh, and you know, we talk about words and, and we used a fake definition, by the way, in the book, which was a good laugh. When <laughs> yeah, it was great. Said to, right, said to Jillian, you know, because she said, well, isn't compromise what's all? He said, well, actually compromise comes from the old Greek, uh, an old Greek word for nobody actually gets what they want. Right. Right. And then of course it doesn't really mean that, but, but it might as well because compromise, and by the way, of course there's a time and place for compromise, but what we say is that shouldn't be your first option. Right. right? Compromise by the very nature of the thing is about lose-lose. It's about both parties giving up something in order to maybe placate or appease or just, you know, kind of keep the peace, right? But it's not, it's not really what both people want. Instead of, instead of uh, compromise, let's try to collaborate and build a bigger pie. This is where one plus one equals three. Wow. You know, and so that's where we want to go to first. But as you said, and I love the point you made because this is so true. It's not as though influence is some magical, mystical thing that all of a sudden, no, it just advances the world. It moves, hey, you know, any invention that's ever come, in, come to us has had to be sold, right? Uh, because people are by nature skeptical. That's the reptilian mind. They don't yeah. want to take a chance with something new. So any new thing, whether it, you know, whether it was the, the steam invention, you know, the train, or whether it was this, or whether it was that, or whether it had to be, had, people had, someone had to influence others. It usually didn't happen right away. Uh, Seth Godin tells a great story in his book, Purple Cow, about the uh, invention of this machine that would slice bread. Uh, it was invented by someone by the last name of Rowetter. And he invented this machine and it did nothing for 30 years. Now you think about it, we, we have a saying today, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it took 30 years for this machine to actually catch on. And it was only when this company by the name of Wonder Bread started using it to slice their prepackaged bread that the world caught on to what would become the greatest thing since Whatever. Yep. 
So influence can take time. It can influence take a can take series, series of drips. Some, okay. some, and sometimes it can be like that, and other times it can take time. It just depends on the situation. But there need be no fear when someone influences the right way. Now, we've also seen many people throughout history influence through manipulation, which is right. like force, control, compliance. And that's not a good thing, whether it's in a corporation or whether it's in a government. Now, there's a thing, though, about... Um, terms like influence is that they are for certain groups of people. So it's for a leader, it's for a salesperson, it's for a politician, it's for people that have this divine responsibility to lead other people towards making a decision or an action or an outcome. That is, is often where the thought towards influence lives. But who else are the other user groups that could benefit from having a little bit more skill or foresight or understanding into how they can influence others in an ethical fashion? Well, I think everyone does influence. Okay. Um, you know, if, if, you know, and it might be the, the, uh, the preschooler who wants uh, someone else to share their toy. Okay. They're trying to influence. Now, again, if they do it by grabbing that toy, well, that's, that's not the right way. If so should, they, the, should the preschooler read the book? I don't think they're going to be ready quite at that age to do it, but I think <laughs> the parents will be able to take the lessons from it. You know, we have a oh. lot of families who use the go-giver um as a family study you know type of thing and they have their kids reading it and so forth but i don't think it's necessary to have the kids read it but i think the parents will be able to take basic principles from this okay. and be able to teach it to very young and, uh, and and jackson and jillian have this this very transactional piece that runs through the seven day period of time it's about the signing of the contract the agreement of a business and yeah. you know negotiation etc it's a business setting why is it that we're, we're in a business setting, but we're saying that these principles of influence can be used everywhere in life? Mm -hmm. The Go-Giver series is, by and large, it's a business, business series. Uh, but we always try to have a subplot in there that, that, because we, we truly believe that universal laws work across the board. And success is not a matter of, of simply financial, although that's important, but the success in terms of financial, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, social, relational, probably a dozen other ways, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so that's why in the, in the Go-Giver, there was also the, the subplot about Joe and Sue in their marriage. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, so we, we try to do that because it is a business book and Portfolio is a business publisher, but we, we like to kind of get the personal in there too. Love it, love it. And I think this whole thread that runs through you ask, about- You ask the best questions. I, this, this <laughs> great, nobody asks that, it's great. This is why I ignore the brief that anybody ever sends me on questions. And, and I, I wanna come at you on this point on emotion as well. Like that people make decisions based on emotion and there's, there's talk towards emotion in the book. And it's great to talk about the power of influence when we're plugging into using emotion to be able to drive decisions. But what about when we mess it up? We've tried to lead somebody towards something. We've tried to get involved in a conversation to do the right thing for what we believed in. We've tried to change somebody's point of view and it's, and it's ended worse than it started. What do we do now? Okay, this is what we would call not a good thing. <laughs> it's not a good thing. I don't like that to happen. <laughs> but, it, but it happens. I think people are fearful of that so they don't move into it because they're fearful of what might happen. Yeah. Um, well, that's why, you know, I think the more we can equip ourselves with the information, again, not just from this book, but from many books, from How to Win Friends and Influence People, from your books, from, you know, we all, uh, we can never stop learning. Um, and then we also have to know we're human beings and we're never going to always get it right. Okay. And, you know, and so when we do mess up, which we will, which we all do because we're human beings, uh, you know, we can feel a little badly about it, but only enough so that we know we want to correct ourselves the next time. We don't have to go into any kind of really bad guilt trip. We'll have other chances. Um, but when it's appropriate to apologize to someone, we apologize. You know, when it, we're not able to do that or for whatever reason the circumstances aren't able, then we just use that experience for the next time. Okay. Yeah. But a humble apology is no bad thing. Uh, a humble apology is a wonderful thing, but we just also have to know how to apologize correctly. We take responsibility for it. We don't make an excuse for it. And we uh, let someone know that we will do better the next time. And then the next time when, we, when the opportunity presents itself, we hopefully do better. Okay. So it's a hands up. It's no buts. It's no, yeah, it was because of it. Right. My, it, it's my bad. However you want to say my bad, exactly. <laughs> it's taking full personal responsibility for it. Now I've been scribbling notes down as we've been going through here is I just got kind of one more point that I want to get towards with you is, is this genuinely seeing something from somebody else's point of view, this being in other people's shoes. It's, it's being aware of the fact that they're, they're not the same size mm -hmm. is 
that sounds great, but how do you do that in, in practice? I mean, we get all these versions of right. We talk about what's happening online. It's easy to be able to side with the majority. It's easy to get caught with the current. It's easy to be able to, you know, not have enough information to make a decision and find ourselves being one side or the other. How do we actually go about doing that? Because principle is great. Reality is somewhere altogether different. Okay, let's, let's use a very simple example. Um, and, and I call this the question you can ask in order to avoid any misunderstandings. Okay. okay. And of course, it's not just one question because it's never within a vacuum. But let's say you're part of a team. It's a four-person team within a company who's doing a project. The project manager, the leader, team leader says, there's been a change. Everyone has to have their work in as soon as possible. Okay, boom. Now, it's Wednesday afternoon, close of day. Uh, so it's a couple days later, the team leader calls everyone around and says, okay, where's your work? Well, only one person has it in. Why? You know, I said as soon as possible. Well, to one person, as soon as possible means you drop everything you're doing and you get it in right away. To another person, they come from another team where as soon as possible meant as soon as you finish your current work, then you go and do this. The other person comes from another company and was on a team where as soon as possible meant absolutely nothing. <laughs> so you've got four different people, you've got different definitions of what as soon as possible means, okay? Now, what if one of the people on the team said to the team leader, leader Sue or, or Dave, um, if I may ask, just, to, just for my own clarification, that's part of saying something tactfully, you know, just for my own clarification, um, when you say as soon as possible, is there a specific day or, or time you're thinking? Boom. Now the team leader will say, yes, it needs to be in end of day, five o'clock Wednesday. Okay. Gotcha. So what we want to do is never assume that we know what someone else means or that they know what we mean because right. we don't and they don't. <laughs> so we just simply in a very kind, tactful way, we ask people to, clar to uh, clarify or to define their terms. Okay. So there's those two big things then, right? Take a big breath, pause for a second. Mm-hmm and then ask a clarifying question so that you can find out that you're on the same page. Exactly, exactly. That, that's simple. The, way, the team leader, had they been a, an effective communicator, would have been the one to say, you know, there's been a change, we need this in as soon as possible. And by that, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, we need everyone's work by end of day, five o'clock Wednesday. But okay. so, why didn't he do that? I don't know. <laughs> why do people so, not so, so we shouldn't communicate then if we want to be influential in some way in, in things that aren't clear. Right. So banning exactly. phrases like ASAP from our vocabulary in its entirety <laughs> would probably be a, be a reasonable idea, right? Okay. Okay. This is awesome. Bob, um, I love your work. I don't want to give away everything in the book Likewise. while we're here into the, into the interview. But I really think that this, this is a piece of work like much of your others is, is a for everybody. And I know that's a hard thing to be able to point at is, is a book for everybody, but I think you've nailed it. And this one is that it, it's got that, that, um, well, the beauty in it, in the fact that it's timeless, you know, I, I really believe that in our lifetime that this stuff won't go out of fashion. I'm a big believer that questions lead to conversations, conversations, build relationships, relationships, create opportunities, and those opportunities lead to action, sales, decisions, outcomes, whatever. Well, no, no one teaches that better than you do. But this is a book that tells a great story. It is one big conversation. Conversations in people's heads, conversations in people's minds, conversations between people. And, and to be a fly on the wall on all of those conversations, which I think that this book really is, is, um, is a masterclass in influence in something that takes really um, no more than two hours to read. It's like 176 pages. 35, 40 of those are pages telling you what you've just learned and giving you some more information. <laughs> If you fly somewhere, you could read it on a flight just about anywhere. If you're on a train, you could probably pick it up in almost every journey. If you're going on vacation, you'd catch it in one sun tanning session. It's, um, it's something that I would highly encourage people to pick up. And I invited you on the show today because um, I really wanted to kick this off with the important term. I'm a big believer, same as you are, is if that we can seek to understand more about other people's points of view, that what we can do is, is have a better knowledge 
on the foundation pace of where other people's beliefs are coming from. We've got the ability to change the world, one conversation, one word, one little piece of influence at a time. So Bob, thanks for coming on board to talk about influence. We finished words with friends with, uh, with one standard question, which is, what is your favorite word? I just want to know what your favorite word is. A word that it might be your favorite in the second, it might be your favorite forever, but a word that you just love and why? Oh my goodness. What a great question. What is my favorite word? Well, I think about how with my family, we always say, I love you. And then the other one say, I love you more. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with love in this one. There we go. We're kicking off with all you need is love, right? A little John Lennon classic. <laughs> um, Bob, where do people get the book? When can they get the book? How do they get involved and find out more about you? Uh, they can go to thegogiver.com without the hyphen, thegogiver.com, and they can click on the uh, graphic of the book. It's got the purple cover, and it will take them to a page where they can get the first two chapters and read those if they'd like to see if they like where it's headed. Then they can always click through to Amazon or wherever else they'd like. That's it. And I think it's April this year, right? April 2018 April, April, that it, uh, it starts to be shipped out and, and packed on. So I've had the privilege of getting start to finish on it. And um, from my word to everybody listening in right now, just do yourself a massive favor. Buy it, read it, share it, and um, most importantly, put it into practice. Thank Bob, you. thanks for being on the show. It's been a treat as always. Phil, thank you. The pleasure is absolutely mine.